Hi folks, welcome back. This is the second lecture on grammar and mechanics. And if you haven't seen the first lecture on this topic, go back and watch that first. And that one we talk about clauses, independent and dependent clauses, basically uh, items of a sentence that have a subject and a verb. Uh, this time we'll be talking about a smaller piece called phrases. And these will not have a subject and verb. Uh, but they still play very important roles in the sentence. Now we'll be talking about five types of uh, the prepositional, participial, infinitive, gerund, and a positive. And these are really cool, especially when you think about the uh, just think about the, the sophistication of our language, uh, that they have all these kind of functions. You could take a, a verb and make it, do, make it do the work of an adjective or an adverb or even a, a noun. Uh, so our language is very flexible. It's a very powerful tool. And I like to uh, zero in on these uh, things like phrases and clauses because they really get at the, uh, just how incredible our language is. That's really fascinating to me. Okay, the first one is the prepositional phrase. Now, I had a professor, uh, somebody had asked him, uh, what is a preposition? And he said, well, think about the word preposition. It's got the word position in it, uh, which you know what that means, and it's got the word pre, or the prefix pre, and that just means something before. So this is something that comes before uh, that positions a phrase. So the list of prepositions, there's many, many of these, but they're words like on, by, of, under, below, until, uh, all those words like that. And what they have after them is usually uh, some type of noun. So look at this. The book on the table. So on is the preposition there. And the table is the object of that preposition on. Let's say noun, the table. So the book on the table was written by a distinguished member of faculty. So there we have by a distinguished member of faculty. So you notice there's no commas in this in, in these because it's very easy to read this sentence. We don't have to put commas in there for people to understand it. Uh, the second one, though, since uh, we've got of the four choices on the menu, comma, the Pelican Burger is my favorite. Now that one you have to put a comma in because it's coming before the rest of the sentence. You notice uh, the Pelican Burger is my favorite. That is the independent clause that could stand all by itself, whereas of the four choices on the menu, that's just a phrase. Uh, so since it comes before that main clause, you have to put a comma there. Uh, last example here. Please place the rabid squirrel into this cage. So we have this cage is the object of the preposition into. So hopefully that's clear enough. Okay, now we get into the participial phrases. Um, now these will start with something called a participle, and it can start with either a past or present form of a participle. So you're probably like, what the heck's a participle? Well, that's just a, a verb form. So you could take any verb and basically modify it so that instead of telling you what somebody did, it's actually going to uh, serve as an adjective. Basically describe a noun. So here's some examples of this. The first one, recommended by four out of five charlatans, comma, sugar gum is great for your teeth. Okay, look at this word, uh, recommended. Now you could use this as a verb, right? I recommend that you watch the first lecture. Uh, but here it's not really doing the same thing. Instead of, just, instead of uh, defining an action, it's a, an adjective recommended by four out of five charlatans, sugar gum. So this whole phrase here is an adjective describing sugar gum. Sugar gum's a noun, so if there's something describing it, uh, that has to be an adjective. A second example, uh, Wonder Woman, comma, flying in her invisible jet, comma, spotted her nemesis. So same thing here, we have flying. Now that's normally a verb, uh, I flew to Denver. But here we're using it as an adjective describing Wonder Woman. Uh, Wonder Woman, comma, flying in her invisible jet. That's telling you something about Wonder Woman there. So she's a, a noun, so this is an adjective. A zebras, comma, best known for their unusual stripes are the subject of today's lecture. So there again, we have the verb know. We've changed it to the uh, participle, participle known. Best known for their unusual stripes is describing zebras. Now you notice that a lot of these have commas around them. Um, if you take those commas out, it would be a run on or a fused sentence. Uh, so you kind of, you can tell sometimes when you need a comma just by reading it out loud. Zebras, best known for their unusual stripes. So if you listen carefully, you'll hear, you'll hear pauses when I read that and you could know to put the commas in there. Okay, then we have infinitive phrases. And uh, these start with the word uh, to. So they're pretty easy to spot these, right? Um, and they will, uh, 
be like a to act or not to starve? That is the question. So we have to act, that's the infinitive. To starve, there's another infinitive. If you've got uh, them together, there you have a phrase. Now, my goal has always been to get rich selling solar powered flashlights. So there we have to get, that's our infinitive, and uh, whatever comes after that will be the infinitive phrase. She likes to fly in a luxury airliner. Uh, she likes to fly in luxury airliners, I'm sorry, uh, but her husband prefers to take a bus. So you notice these infinitives here are working as nouns, right? She likes, what does she like? To fly in luxury airliners. So we've taken the verb fly and basically we're making this do the work of a noun. She likes to fly in luxury airliners. Now you might be looking at this uh, to fly in luxury airliners and thinking that's not a noun. Uh, that's a verb uh, to uh, fly. But you could also plug in she likes airliners or she likes airplanes. And that clearly is a noun. So we're doing the same thing, but we're instead of putting a regular noun there like uh, airplanes or airliners, uh, we change it to to fly in luxury airliners. So you see how cool uh, the language is, right? You could take a verb and make it do the work of a noun, sort of the opposite. Okay, then we get into gerund phrases. And uh, these are noun forms of a verb that end in ing. So it's basically the same thing as the infinitive, but instead of putting to in front of a, uh, in front of a verb to make it a noun, we're just going to uh, stick ing on the end of it. Now these can be subject or objects too. So saltwater fishing off the coast of Mexico is my idea of a good time. So saltwater fishing there is our gerund, or fishing, and uh, that's basically the subject of this sentence. It's the noun phrase. Now you think about the word fishing, I could say, um, I was fishing yesterday, that's a verb, or I could say fishing is my favorite hobby or my favorite sport. Uh, so there, fishing is not a verb anymore, right? It's a, the subject of a sentence, so it's a noun. A second example, you might enjoy eating at Anton's. So you notice eating and fishing both end in ing, and they're both uh, followed by something. Here we have at Anton's, which is the um, object there. So you, you might enjoy what? So if the whatever is going to answer a question what, that's going to be a noun. It'll be the subject or the object, and since it's following that verb telling you what you enjoy, you know that's the object. So you might enjoy eating at Anton's is the object of that sentence there, or the object of uh, uh, enjoy, and it's got the gerund eating and then at Anton's. Okay, so then we'll get into the really weird uh, positive phrases. Now these uh, basically rename a or restate a subject or object. So you put a subject in a sentence, like look at a number one here, Dolly, and we instead of just saying Dolly, we want to put something else after that. So we say Dolly, comma, a truly interesting artist, comma, was known for his unusual subjects. So that's called an, a positive phrase there. You kind of interrupt the flow of the sentence by plugging in this little extra piece of information. So you could just say Dolly was known for his unusual subjects. You could take this out completely, but you know, sometimes you want to put it in. It, you could write two separate sentences, right? You have Dolly was a truly interesting artist, period. He was known for his unusual subjects. But why do that when you can just make it a positive phrase? A second example, your computer, comma, a Commodore 64 is still a fine machine. Kraftwerk, comma, a German electronic band, comma, pioneered techno music. Now, if you notice, all of these examples, when we have it a positive phrase, we always put commas around it. We put one before it, one after it, just so the uh, reader doesn't get confused. And you need to also be aware that you don't want to make these too long. If you've got Dolly, a truly interesting artist, that's pretty short. So by the time you hit that was there, you can still remember Dolly. Uh, sometimes students make a mistake and they have too long of a phrase and then by the time you get to that verb you've already forgotten what the subject was so you don't want to do that keep them short okay phrases and commas now always put the comma after an introductory phrase this is a very common error doesn't matter how short the phrase is if it's uh, yesterday that's not even a phrase it's just one word yesterday my troubles seem so far away but you still the sentence there is my troubles seem so far away Yesterday is something you put in front of it. That's fine, but just remember, put a comma after it. Every day, comma, teachers should find new ways to appeal to their students. 
Now this one's particularly important because if you didn't put that pause there, you sound like you're saying something different, right? If I say everyday teachers should find new ways to appeal to their students, that sounds, uh, that has a different meaning than everyday teachers should. You can, you can hear the difference there. Okay, the third example, determining the exact location of an electron, comma, Dr. Goberding, uh, Dr. Goberdingle did not notice super snail quietly oozing by. So you get the idea. Any phrase that comes before your main clause, you stick a comma after it. Now we're going to get into something really technical, restrictive versus non-restrictive. <laughs> this drives everybody nuts. Uh, but you just it's, it's simple enough if you just think about the definition. So you're going to have situations where you're trying to decide, do I need to put a comma there or not? Now, basically, you put the comma if it is non-restrictive, and you don't put any commas if it's restrictive. Well, you're like, well, that's helpful. I have no idea what you're talking about. So let's think about what we, what we mean by restrictive and non-restrictive. Okay, so one, if the phrase or element is necessary for the reader to distinguish it or define it, that's what we call restrictive. It's restricting the meaning of a word down to a smaller subset. Uh, secondly, though, if the phrase or element is just extra superfluous information, uh, that only it's describing the subject, but it's not defining it, uh, that's what we call non-restrictive. So here's some examples of restrictive elements. Please, rate, please read the plays by Shakespeare for the next class. Now, we don't put commas around by Shakespeare, because if I, if I don't tell you by Shakespeare, uh, you don't know which plays to read. So basically what I'm saying with this structure is if you have the word plays, that's too, it could be any plays, right? So I say plays by Shakespeare, that's going to define the plays that I'm talking about. It's going to restrict the meaning of the word plays to just the little subset, those written by Shakespeare. Uh, second example, the book that I need for this course was not available in the bookstore. So here we have the book that I need for this course. There's no commas there, because if I just said the book, you know, there's some, how many books are there in the world, right? So I need to put something after it that I need for this course. That's going to restrict or narrow the meaning of the word book to specifically one book. So there's no commas there. Also notice that it has the word that. Now that, use the word that when you want to have a restrictive element. Now if I wanted to make it non-restrictive, I would use which and have commas around it. So just remember that, restrictive, which, non-restrictive. It's a very useful distinction. Okay, here we have some non-restrictives. So, my oldest brother, comma, Luke, entered college this semester. So, Luke there is extra information because you already know, it's already been narrowed down. I said the oldest brother. How many oldest brothers can you have? You can only have one. So, at that point, anything you add to it is going to be extra information. You don't need it to know uh, which one you're talking about. All right, so the second example, uh, the dog, which you may recognize from previous dog shows, comma, may appear on a television commercial. Now there, by using the word which, I'm signaling that this is a non-restrictive element. Somehow you already know the dog in question. So I'm just giving you extra information here. Now this is why it's difficult to set up a quiz about this topic, because you don't necessarily know if the reader is familiar with this or not. You know, maybe there was a previous paragraph and you know, I've talked about the dog the whole time, so you know exactly which dog I'm talking about by this point. Um, otherwise, I would have, if you didn't know, and I wanted to make this restrictive, I would have to use that, and not put commas there. All right, so some tips for this. Uh, so if you're looking at the element and trying to figure out, do you need commas? So first question to ask, does it just provide extra information, or does it restrict the meaning of the word? Uh, two, does it begin with that or which? That's a dead giveaway. It should be easy. If it's got the word that in front of it, no commas. It's restrictive. If it's got the word which, uh, that is non-restrictive. So you need to put commas around it. Okay, so moving on, we have uh, contrasting elements. Now these are very easy. They're very simple. You just have to be watchful and see if you're doing this. So basically what you've got is a small element that negates or contradicts or goes in a different direction uh, than what you just said. So, I asked for pancakes, comma, not waffles. Jax, not clay, showed up at the meeting. 
So if you read, you know, this is another example where if you read it out loud, you'll be able to hear those pauses. And you should know that's probably where you should put commas. So just remember if you've got not or but in there, something that's going to negate what you just said, you put commas around it. And that's called a contrasting element. Okay, now we get into modifier placement. So we've been talking this whole time about all kinds of modifiers, adjectives, adverbs, they could be clauses, they could be phrases. Um, the important thing though is when you set up your sentence, you want to make sure that those elements, uh, whatever those modifiers are, are clearly lined up with what they should modify. So some, there's two different errors related to this. Uh, one is the dangling modifier, which means you just didn't put it in at all. Uh, what this modifier is supposed to be modify. Uh, more common is the misplaced modifier. So you have it in the sentence somewhere else, but it's not where it's supposed to be. So let's look at some examples of these dangling modifiers. Looking through the binoculars, comma, the duck skated across the lake. Now, unless you've got a Disney situation here with Donald Duck, uh, you probably, the duck is not the one with the binoculars, right? So you have to add that. Uh, looking through the binoculars, comma, I saw the duck skating across the lake. Now notice where it is in the sentence. Looking through the binoculars, that's the element, and right after it is I. So it's no question about who's looking through the binoculars. Now there's also misplaced modifiers. Uh, th this situation is, uh, like I said, the, the thing that's supposed to modify is somewhere else in the sentence. Uh, number one, loudly ringing, we didn't hear the phone. Now again, unless this is a bell choir uh, scenario, uh, you probably mean the phone is ringing, not the people. So we need to rearrange this. Uh, we didn't hear the loudly ringing phone. So all we did was move loudly ringing to right in front of phone. Notice also, since it doesn't come first anymore, uh, we don't have to put the commas around it. Second example, sipping margaritas, the ducks swam past us. So unless this is Howard the Duck, uh, we probably want to rearrange this sentence. Sipping margaritas, comma, we watch the ducks swim past. Okay, so some tips for modifiers. One, put them right next to the words they're supposed to modify. Two, if you can't figure it out, if it's confusing in any way for you, it's definitely going to be confusing for the reader. So just erase the sentence, start over, uh, see if you can make it clear for, somehow. Uh, three, if you've got a really short modifiers like only, barely, often, uh, these can be a real pain because uh, they can lead to something called a split uh, or squinting modifier. So you really want to make sh double sure with those. You've got them right next to the word they're supposed to modify. Okay, moving on then to pronouns. A pronoun has to have something in it th that uh, it stands for. I had a student one time, I said, can you define pronoun? You know, this guy raises his hand and says, well, that's a noun that gets paid to be a noun. And not quite a funny joke, uh, probably the funniest uh, answer I've ever had in an English class, but uh, nevertheless, that's not quite what we're talking about. So the a pronoun is just a word that stands in uh, for a noun that you've already mentioned. So you don't want to have to keep saying, uh, Dr. Barton this, Dr. Barton that, Dr. Barton, you know, they get pretty old pretty fast. So you say Dr. Barton once, and then after that you could say he, and there's no problem as long as the reader can figure out who the he is. So here's some examples, the boy likes fish. He especially likes fish sticks. Now, nobody reading this is going to get to that word he and suddenly not know what the heck you're talking about. He just said the boy, so it's obvious that goes with he. Uh, the students have finished their assignment. They will now begin the next chapter. So this is very easy. Everybody gets this. There's no problems. Uh, there is problems, though, if you don't have the right form of the pronoun. Now, English isn't as bad as some languages. Uh, some languages have a lot more forms that you have to worry about. Uh, but Fortunately, in English, we really only have three things to consider. Uh, one is the number, so you're not going to use uh, there if you've only got one thing, like the boy goes with he. Uh, the girl goes with she, not with there. Uh, that's number. A uh, case is a little bit more confusing. Uh, this is whether it's the subject or the object. So I would say I like grammar, not me like grammar. So that I there is a subject. If we had the uh, object form, though, if I said I like him or I like he, you know, obviously it's him. Uh, so that is the object case. Then finally we have gender. Uh, again, this is a little easier in English. We don't have to worry about some of the other forms, but use he for guys and she for girls. <laughs> it doesn't get much more complicated than that. And then right along with this is the subject and verb 
disagreements and we'll also cover those. It's basically the same concept. So first of all, number. The boys, the four boys, have left their snacks behind. So you know you have have and there because you're talking about more than one boy. If you just had the boy, it would say the boy has left his snack behind. Uh, the boy had left his popcorn in the microwave. Good example. Uh, the mutant camel is spitting its radioactive acid at the space marine. Now this, you know, when you're talking about animals, it can be a little confusing. Should you use its or he or she? Uh, really, that's just up to the author. Um, unless you've got a personal attachment to the animal, though, you probably should just use its. Uh, so note how those verbs agree with their subjects. Now, secondly is case. So we said we have subjective case and objective case. Uh, so the subjective is the subject of a verb. The objective is the object of a verb. So subject, let's take a verb, uh, uh, fly. If I say Wonder Woman flies her plane, uh, Wonder Woman is the subject. She's the doing the flying. And what is being flown is the object, the plane. Okay, subjective case. One, they demonstrated the concept. I wouldn't say them demonstrated the concept. Uh, two, who left this wiener on the counter? Who is the subject of the verb left? My friend and I enjoy playing Donkey Kong Country. It's a great game. Now, sometimes people put my friend and me. Uh, that's wrong because that is the subjective case. It should be in the subjective case because it's the subject of the, of the verb enjoy. Now, if you're confused by this, just take out the first part and just look at the I. I enjoy playing Donkey Kong or me enjoy playing Donkey Kong. I think you know which one is correct. Okay, let's look at objective case. Uh, the reporter watched them closely. So what was being watched? You know, that's the object, them. You wouldn't say the reporter watched they closely. And now we get into who and whom. Uh, to whom was your comment directed, sir? Now this one's a little trickier, and I put it in because it's, you know, I want to, you know, get, get to who and whom eventually. It's not really commonly used anymore, but it's basically the same as he and him. But you do have sentences like this a lot where it starts with the uh, preposition to. So you just have to remember that's going to be an object form because it's the object of the preposition to. So to whom was your comment directed, sir? Uh, that's going to be whom instead of who. Uh, I enjoy playing video games with him and her. So the, again, we had that uh, preposition situation. Uh, with is a preposition, so it's going to have objects to go with it. So since it's an object, it's going to be him and her, not he and she. Then the fourth, I saw my friend and her crossing the plateau. So my friend and her, those are objects because you're saying what was being seen. Okay, so some caveats then with pronoun agreement. Uh, one is if it has the word or in it. So if you have or in the subject or object uh, position, separating out some uh, different nouns, uh, you have to go with the, you have to make everything line up with the uh, word that's closer to the pronoun and verb. So the geese or the duck has left its travel plans here on the desk. So the duck is closer to has and its than the geese. So then you make everything line up with that. Now if you've got, let's go ahead and flip this around. So if we said the duck or the geese, then you got geese closer. So that would be have left their travel plans. And the last example, if it's got and, then you know it's got to be plural then, because uh, and only works if you got more than one thing. Uh, so the more caveats with case, here's a couple of common things that people do wrong. They say, it's me. So if someone said, who is the winner? You know, somebody say, it's me. Uh, that's wrong, though, because you've got uh, is or a being verb instead of an action verb. So with the being verbs, they're really funny like this because uh, both sides have to be subjects because you're not really defining an action. Uh, these are just states of being. So it is I is the correct form. So think about Zorro. It is I, Zorro. Uh, he's perfectly grammatically correct by saying that. Uh, same thing with this is he. So say, well, you know, who, uh, which of these guys here is Matt? Oh, this is, this is he. Uh, you'd probably want to say this is him. Uh, but again, that would be wrong. Uh, another case is when you have a situation called an elliptical element. So it's a little piece of the sentence that you just left off because it's understood to be there, but you don't say it. Uh, you are taller than I. Does that sound uh, right to you? Uh, maybe, maybe not. You might want to say you are taller than me, 
but that's wrong. The reason that's wrong is because we're leaving out a little am there. We just took it out, didn't put it in, but it's still there. You still have to make everything line up as though it were there. You are taller than I am. You wouldn't say you are taller than me am, so you have to put I there. You speak more loudly than he. Again, this is correct. You speak more loudly than he does. Okay, now we get into indefinite pronouns. This is a huge problem for so many students. Um, a lot of it has to do, I guess, with political correctness. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. But if you have a word like somebody, anybody, someone, everything, any of these words that ends with body, one, or thing, uh, then you know that's going to have to be uh, treated as though it were a singular. I'll get to this in a second. Now, there's a few indefinite pronouns, though, that can be either or, and there's some that are always plural. So there's three different ways these guys can, can go down. So you really have to pay attention and probably memorize some of the stuff. So easy if it ends in body, one, or thing, because you know that has to be singular. Everybody is bringing his or her Spock ears to the convention. Now, a lot of people would put there instead of his or her, but that is wrong, because remember, everybody is treated as a singular. Um, so, same thing with each. Each of the iPods comes with its own selection of opera selections. So, if you see a word that ends in body, one, or thing, or you see each, you know, it's got to be singular, it's got to be it, it's got to be he or she uh, every time. Now, if you don't know, if, you if this doesn't sound right to you, just think. Would you say everybody are coming to town? Everybody are here. So, think about, why would you say everybody is? coming if uh, the you, you had more than one thing. You would say are, right? You wouldn't say the boys is, you'd say the boys are. So it doesn't make sense then if you're going to use is and then use uh, they or them uh, with that because then you have disagreement. So if you get, see this on a quiz, you get confused, you don't know what to put. Look at the verb. Are they using a singular or plural form? Is it is or are? Is it has or have? And then make it line up with the appropriate pronoun. So is, his. Okay, here's some that can be, um, or, or I'm sorry, that are always plural. Both, few, many, others, and several. So these are easy enough. Several of the slinkies were left in their original packaging. Uh, well, I'm out, but the others still want to present their papers at the conference. So nobody says both people is here, uh, so that's fairly easy to get those right. And now we have the hardest ones of all, uh, this little list here. Uh, any, all, more, most, some, and none. Now you just have to memorize these because they change depending on how they're used. So all of the Twinkies are past their expiration date. So there we're treating it as more than one. All of the Twinkie has been eaten. It was yummy. So there we're treating it as one thing. All of the Twinkie has been eaten. It was yummy. So again, if you see this on a quiz and you don't know what to put, uh, just look at those verbs there. So are, remember that goes with more than one thing, so that would be there. Uh, the other one though, has, you only use that with one thing, so that has to be it. So with this list, all, any more, most, some, and none, look at what comes after. If it's all of the Twinkies, uh, that's one thing. If it's all of the Twinkie, that's going to be something else. So pay attention. Now finally, it's and it's. Now, Everybody knows, yeah, I ask any student, what is the difference between these two? And they say ITS means possessive, and IT apostrophe S means it is or it has. So if you have no apostrophe there, uh, that's the possessive pronoun form. Smoking cigars has lost its charm for me. If you have the apostrophe, it is, it is or it has. So it's amazing that you didn't learn this already. Or what a, what a strange trip it's been. So that would be what a strange trip it has been. Okay, so let's look at some mistakes from some papers. Uh, here's uh, the first one. Any good student makes time for the things they want to do, aside from the things they have to do. Uh, so again, uh, the any good student is going to be a problem because we just said uh, that list changes depending on if you're using one or more than one thing. So any good student makes time for the things he or she wants to do, aside from the things he or she has to do. So we don't say they, have to say he or she because we've got uh, any good student. Uh, same thing here. When one is taking this class, they will be required. So we just said if it ends in one body or thing, uh, then it has to be treated singular. So this should be, again, he or she. 
Now this he or she, him or her business. Nobody particularly likes this. It's uh, politically sensitive, true, but it, get, it can make a sentence, it can clog up a sentence really bad. Um, in every class he or she takes, a good student brings his or her textbook, and always does his or her homework. I mean, it sounds like you're, you're joking around after a while. So all you need to do is, instead of saying the good student, just change it to good students. And then you can use they. So in every class they take, comma, good students bring their textbooks and always do their homework. So just if you're in the habit of saying the student or the you know, cheerleader or the football player or whatever, change, start, start thinking about um, football players, cheerleaders, and then you can use they and there all you want. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, so wrapping up, we've learned a lot in these two lectures. Comma splices, sentence fragments, run-ons, commas with compound sentences, phrases, restrictives and non-restrictive elements, modifier placements, pronoun agreements, and subject-verb agreements. Now, in the last of these, the trio of grammar lectures, we'll be going over the 20 most common errors. But by that point, I'm hoping a lot of, this, a lot of that lecture will be a, a refresher uh, rather than learning it for the first time. So if you're confused about any of these, go back, watch the first lecture, uh, this lecture again, and let me know if you have any questions. Happy to answer, answer those. Anyways, uh, see you guys next time.